Hello, it's Dr. Day Storms, and now in Chapter 8, we're really starting to delve into what makes a chemical bond a chemical bond, and the different types of chemical bonds. And first up, we're going to really focus in on looking into ionic bonds, which are typically between a metal cation and a non-metal anion. But first, let's just quickly review that there are three basic type of bonds. We have ionic bonds, which are due to electrostatic attractions between ions. So we have some of the examples here being like potassium and dichromate. Potassium is a cation, dichromate is a polyatomic anion, magnesium and oxygen make magnesium oxide, and nickel and oxygen make nickel oxide. And when we say electrostatic attractions, that's where you have a positive charge being attracted to a negative charge. A second form are covalent bonds. And we're talking about intra molecular bonding. And here, this is where we have usually two nonmetals, two or more nonmetals that go and they share the electrons between them. So the electrons are being shared, whereas in ionic bonds, one of the partners actually gives its electrons to another partner. And then the third type, which we don't discuss in a lot of, a lot of detail, are the metallic bonds. And once again, we're talking about these intramolecular interactions not intermolecular, like hydrogen bonding, which we'll be discussing in the future. Okay, metallic bonds are when you can actually have metal atoms that are bonded to several other metal atoms. Okay, and so this is just like our copper for copper wire, and gold for your gold ring, and magnesium, and sodium, and so on and so forth. Alright, but first let's focus in on ionic bonding. Okay? So, if we do a review real quick... Remember that when an atoms can either lose or gain electrons, and they become ions, because then they have a disproportionate number of protons and electrons. The elements on the left-hand side of the periodic table, those are the metals, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a metal, but the rest of them are metals. They tend to lose electrons. When they lose electrons, they then have a positive charge, or a plus two, or a plus three charge. Those become cations. Likewise... Elements on the right-hand side, the nonmetals, including hydrogen, they can gain electrons in order to look like noble gases. And whenever they gain electrons, they now have more electrons than protons, so they have a negative charge. And they're called anions. So let's just look at the you know, textbook example, so to speak, of an ionic bond. Here we're talking about table salt, sodium chloride. We know it's a nice little crystal, it's tightly packed. And it's the characteristic one that's often used because people can relate to it. You know, so we have the sodium metal. So this is a good review for what we've been doing the last couple of chapters. We have sodium metal, which only has one valence electron. It loses one electron, so that way it now has the electron configuration of neon because it wants to look like a noble gas. That's called the octet rule. It likes to have eight electrons in its outer shell. Okay? And remember, when, when an atom loses electrons and becomes a cation, it's actually smaller than the parent atom. Likewise, we have chlorine, when it's neutral. It likes to gain an electron, so that there it could actually take one from the sodium, it likes to gain an electron. Whenever it gains an electron, it's then going to look like argon, the natural gas, and it's going to have eight electrons in its outer shell. So that's called the octet rule. It's now happy, but it's now got one electron more than the number of protons, so it's got a negative one charge. And just to review, please note that when an atom gains an electron to become an anion, it's actually bigger than the parent atom. So once we have that, you can see where the sodium and the chloride now can be attracted to each other. We have a positive charge, and we have a negative charge, and so then they can actually form these crystal structures. Okay? And one final thing that I want to point out is I mentioned the octet rule, and that's true especially uh, for the elements that's on the second row of the periodic table. Where they want to have eight electrons in their valence shell. Now, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, to a certain extent, they don't do the octet rule. They want to look like helium, 
And so they do what's called the duet rule, where they have two electrons in their outer shell. That's why lithium, which has an atomic number of three, it loses one of its electrons to become Li+, plus, and now it has an outer shell of two electrons. So, last chapter, we talked about the idea here that um, sodium, or metals just in general, there's this idea of ionization energy. And sodium, it takes 495 kilojoules per mole to remove the one electron from its outer shell in order for it to look like neon. So you actually have to put in energy into this system. Likewise, you get some of that energy back. Okay, because if it gives the electron to chlorine, now the chlorine here gives off 349 kilojoules per mole because the chlorine is happy since it now looks like argon. But if you notice, we didn't get all of the energy back, and so you would say that it would be energetically unfavorable. However, it's not. This doesn't explain what we actually see occurring in nature. Because what happens is when you put a sodium and a chloride together, so chlorine, if you remember, is one of the diatomic elements, and it's a gas, and if you drop in sodium metal, it is extremely exothermic. Okay, and so it's going to form salt, sodium chloride salt. So why, what is it about that that explains... There's got to be a third piece to this puzzle. A third piece. It's not just the ionization energy and the electron affinity. That third piece is due to the idea that that positive charge and that negative charge are so attracted to each other, it's called electrostatics, that you get energy. Energy is given off because of that, that, that um, beneficial attraction between the two partners. Okay, and so what I'm trying to say here is this positive charge on the sodium and this negative charge on the chlorine are so attracted to each other that they're going to actually give off energy. I like to draw. Okay, so that's called an electrostatic interaction or electrostatic attraction between these newly formed ions. That brings us to that third piece of the puzzle, and it's called lattice energy. And lattice energy is defined, it's like, it's how much energy it would take to separate out a mole of the ions from each other. You pull that, how much energy would it take in order to pull the chlorine away from the sodium? Because how much energy it would take to pull them apart is how much energy that they give off. Remember, it's just the plus sign versus the minus sign from chapter 5. That's defined by Coulomb's Law. So if you remember from class, we said Coulomb's Law, so that's the electrostatic energy. And it's directly proportional to the charge. Oops, here, let me undo that one. It's directly proportional to, to charge. So there's the charge. And it's inversely proportional to distance. But now there's this proportionality constant, which is kappa here. But Q1 and Q2 are the charges. D is the distance, because the closer together the ions are, or the smaller the ions are, the stronger that interaction is between the two. Okay, And the higher the charge, the stronger the interaction. Something that's really positively charged and something that's really negatively charged are going to really be attracted to each other. And kappa, once again, is just a, is just a constant. Okay, so Q is the charge on each ion, D is the distance between ions, and kappa is that constant. It's 2.31 times 10 to the minus 19 joule nanometers per coulomb squared. And now the coulomb squared, that's just a, a charge, okay? So let's work an example here. How would we set this up? Let's just suppose that we have, we want to approximate the potential energy between a generic cation, which I'm calling A, and an anion, which I'm calling X. The cation has a charge of plus 1. The anion has a charge of negative 2. Now, what this is saying is, what if the ionic radius of A is 
nanometers in the ionic radius of X is 0.175. You have to be careful here. Sometimes it may say ionic radius, sometimes it says ionic diameter. Remember, diameter is twice the radius. Okay, this may not be drawn to scale. Please note. Here, let me draw a couple of these. All right. So in the red color is the cation, in the darker color is the anion, and what it does tell us is that the radius here is equal to 0 0.200 nanometers. And that the radius here is equal to 0 0.175 nanometers. So what's going to be the total distance between the two? Well, you have to add them up. If you add them up, you're going to get 0 0.3 seven five nanometers. Sorry, my five came out funky. Alright, so that's how much with point two and point one seven five comes out to. So we have point three seven five. So that way you don't have to suffer through my writing abilities. I've worked it out here for you already. So I've set it up. We have a plus one charge times a minus two charge. Then we have point two plus 0.175. So this is going to be equal to negative 2 c squared divided by 0.375 times that kappa. And so if you notice here, we have a nanometers on the top and a nanometers on the bottom, c squared and c squared. So the only unit that's left is the joule, which makes sense because it's, we're looking for an energy. And if you do this, we see an electrostatic energy of negative 1.28 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. That would be how much energy would be given off um, whenever those two um, ions come together. Lattice energy actually increases with the charge. So that's, that's the, those are the Qs. So a plus 1 charge would actually give less energy off than a plus 2 charge. Negative 2 has more energy than a negative 1 charge, and a negative 3 would have even more energy because it's going to be even more strongly attracted to whatever cations that we have. So it's directly proportional with charge. It's going to be inversely proportional to size. So size matters here because of the sense that as they come closer and closer together, so if we remember, remember the energy for the electrostatics is equal to kappa, which is just a constant. Q1, Q2, those are the charges divided by distance. So therefore, as distance gets bigger, if they go farther apart, or if the atoms get or if the ions get larger and larger, it's actually going to be dividing by a larger number, and so the energy will go down. Likewise, if the charges here get larger, so a plus two charge or a plus three charge or minus 2 or minus 3 charge, since the number on the top is getting bigger, the energy, the electrostatic energy, will actually be increasing. So, how does this take into effect? So, if we go back to looking at sodium chloride, you know, this is increasing in energy, and you want to, in order for it to be spontaneous, or to, for it to go, we, it actually needs to be you want energy to be given off overall. Okay, so how can we account for that? First, you remember we had to take some energy for the, the enthalpy of formation in order just to get these to the gaseous phase for them to react with each other. We have to add more energy in order to pluck off and pull off that electron from sodium. That's called ionization energy. Now, the chlorine, when it gains the electron, it gives off some. But if you notice, now we actually are still we would still be above, have positive energy. This is where the lattice energy comes into effect. This is the amount of energy due to the attraction. And so when we do that, overall, now it gives off this much energy is given off whenever sodium and chloride react together in order to make salt.
Okay, so this lattice energy can really, really um, play a, a, a major role in the reason why ions form. Okay, the, this phenomena also explains the octet rule. Because if you think back to last chapter, remember sodium was in that first column of the periodic table, so it only gives off, it only likes to lose one electron, so it can look like neon. Whereas magnesium is in column two, and magnesium likes to lose two electrons in order to look like the noble gas and have the octet rule. If it, lose, if it lost one more, it would be astronomical. It's actually perfectly happy by being a magnesium 2+. And magnesium 2+, will actually make a much tighter, stronger bond than sodium plus 1. All else things considered, you know, assuming that the distance is, is approximately the same. Okay, aluminum actually likes to go ahead and lose up to 3 and become Al3+, because it wants to also be looking like a, a, a the uh, noble gas. So, metals will stop losing the electrons once they look like a noble gas. So, I can't stress this enough. Once they attain this noble gas configuration, they want to stop losing the electrons because the amount of energy becomes so overwhelming to try to... that it, it, Like, for example, here, for certain you lose two electrons... It would have to, you'd have to put in 4,562 kilojoules per mole, and you just don't get enough uh, energy out of that for the lattice energy. So that's why they're going to stop. They are perfectly happy at being a noble gas configuration to look like neon. Hopefully this has helped explain some of the ions. Please go back and review Chapter 2. I can't stress that enough. Look back at Chapter 2 on how to name ions and how to name your acids, and to memorize, you know, to review your polyatomic ions, like ammonium, nitrite, nitrate, sulfite, sulfate, things like that. And I'll see you in class.